I'm Ben Vallack and I'm a software developer. So obviously I use computers day in, day out and I do a lot of typing. Just bought my second mechanical keyboard. So I've had the last one for about a year. Got on really well with it and now I've just bought this one. So there'll be a full review of that coming soon. But I just wanted to talk a little bit about mechanical keyboards in general. And it's actually a really interesting, very exciting kind of area of computing. So there are quite a few things that actually prompted me to start learning about mechanical keyboards and, and switch to one. The first thing that kind of frustrated me about using the Apple keyboards, either on the laptop itself or the separate wireless one was the arrow keys. So they've got these tiny little bunched up, up and down arrow keys in between the left and right ones. And the other thing that was in my mind was that I wanted to use the iPad more. And I knew that if I was to be truly productive on both devices, the Mac and the iPad, I needed to be sharing the same keyboard. So the iPad's an interesting device because it's kind of prompted me to think how I can use it uh, for actual real work. And of course the keyboard is the most important part of that. So there are obviously lots of keyboard cases for the iPad available, but of course those layouts are completely different to the one I'd use with the Mac. So there's a big issue there that I wanted to try and solve. So the other thing I was always wondering about was that flat sort of feel of the Apple keyboards. It's, it's not very tactile. And I was always wondering actually if I was orienting my fingers in the right place. Um, and it sort of felt like there could be a more tactile way. And it, you know, maybe even obviously Apple always relentlessly pursuing this shallow uh, key travel, maybe actually just, you know, a keyboard that lets your fingers push the buttons down a little bit further might actually be a better system there to help that muscle memory. So as I was researching this, thinking, you know, what other options are there, it became clear that there are kind of two camps for keyboards. One of the proprietary ones, like the Apple ones and the Logitech ones, and they use their own internal membranes and switches, you know, it's all, all kind of proprietary stuff. Um, and their goals are kind of different and they mainly focus on thinness and, you know, looking good and sort of, you know, productivity is definitely there, but, you know, obviously with Apple stuff, you know what you're dealing with, uh, looks and aesthetic and ultra slim, that's all part of the deal. Of course, none of those actually have customization as part of the package. It is what it is and you're supposed to just like it as it is. The Apple keyboards are wireless, but obviously they haven't got the multiple device profiles and in, in way to switch between different devices instantly. So that kind of ruled them out for this idea of switching between a Mac and an iPad anyway. But then I discovered mechanical keyboards and people talking about mechanical keyboards. And I was like, okay, this is interesting. It's a little bit old school. What have they got to offer? Why are people so enthusiastic about them? So the idea with mechanical keyboards is they're completely customizable. So both through the firmware and actually, you know, what key does what, but also physically. So there are a whole range of different switches that you can get inside the keyboard and that changes the way they feel. And then you can also customize the keycaps, the little plastic bits on top uh, to for your own color scheme. So, you know, you can, you can really go to town with this and people take it quite seriously. So when you're in the early stages of mechanical keyboard research, what you want to do is get hold of one of these. And now this is a little switch tester. So you can pick these up off off Amazon and they include all the main different switches so you can just about see the different colored switches under these clear keycaps and each one's got a different feel and a different sound and you can tap away on these all day and work out which one you actually really like and then obviously when you buy the keyboard you specify it to have the kind of switch that you prefer. So if you stick around until the end I'm going to do a little sound test and uh, you can see how they move and what they sound like when they do and uh, you can see what kind of variety is on offer. Before we go on, I just wanted to say a little bit about this channel. It's obviously a very new channel. I'm trying to grow it. I really enjoy making these films. So I'm actually a software developer myself and, you know, design and usability is really a core value of mine. So I really enjoy making videos that discuss those elements of other products and how they can fit into your life. So please hit the big red subscribe button and uh, we'll, we'll explore all this fun stuff together. So the other major decision that you have to make when you're choosing a mechanical keyboard is what size to get. Now this is where the fun starts. So you've got your full size keyboard with your numpad and your arrow keys and everything and the number row and the function row, they're obviously big. Uh, I'm not interested in that because I'm after something that is portable so I can grab it with the iPad and, and that becomes my sort of portable computer. The next kind of size down is what's called a 60% keyboard, which gets rid of the numpad. And then there's a, a few variants of the 60% which treat the arrow keys in a slightly different way. Uh, you can either have the dedicated arrow keys or you can have what I had on my first keyboard, which is this one, which has got the arrow keys um, on this tap layer. So shift, alt and control and the, you know, the operating system command key here. If you tap them, they will behave as arrow keys. So there are actually some issues with that tap layer dual function idea, which I'm going to look at in a more detailed video about the size comparisons. But the next size down is a 40% keyboard. And that's actually what I've just bought, which is this one here. So you can see the idea with that is literally just got the four rows, um, no, no number row, no numpad and no arrow keys in the normal location. And I've actually configured this one already slightly differently. So I've only got the left and right arrow keys. And then I use an alternative layer for the other keys. Now I've actually done quite a bit of thinking about 
40% versus 60% and I'm, d I'm going to do another video on that because there's a lot to talk about. But the conclusion I've kind of come to is that 40% is perfect <laughs> and there are lots of reasons why, uh, but that's for another video. And then you've got 30% keyboards, of course, which I think is, you know, the realm of really uh, diehard minimalist keyboard fans maybe. I don't think it can be truly practical. It's just, uh, t you know, too much thinking to do, muscle memory to learn, to deal with that few modifier keys. And then, of course, you've got the decision as to whether or you want to find a wireless one or a USB cabled one. A lot of mechanical keyboards actually aren't wireless. They're used by gamers who just want to plug it in and have that, you know, zero issue, like ultra reliable, ultra fast connection with USB. And I kind of get that. So that's quite interesting. I, I usually always do like to listen to what gamers do because, you know, if it's good enough for a gamer, it's probably fast enough for, you know, normal computing. So as I was looking into this, the, the vibe that I was getting from proponents of mechanical keyboards were that they're really engaging and fun to use in ways that normal keyboards aren't particularly in terms of that tactile feel and, you know, just that sort of involvement with the process of typing. So it's definitely all true, you know, the way they sound and the way they feel, the fact that it's your personalized custom device as well, and it's sort of device agnostic, you know, you, you've got this one keyboard that you can use with all your devices and you, you kind of set it up exactly how you want and it, it becomes more part of you than it does part of the computer. So some people take this whole mechanical keyboard scene to, to extreme lengths and there are, you know, sort of social meets to share what they've done and you can buy circuit boards and build your own or build your own circuit boards. And, you know, this is, I think, the point where it starts to freak out normal people. But actually, you don't have to go that far. Of course, you can just buy a normal mechanical keyboard and, and use it just as a normal person who uses computers for their work. And I think there's, there's actually a lot of merit in that and it's definitely worth checking out. So another area I've discovered about mechanical keyboard owners is they often like to build their own USB cables. And this whole scene where people customize USB cables with paracord and different sleeving and different connectors and quick disconnect things in the middle. Very interesting, very cool. I'm kind of going to pursue that and see what I can come up with there as well. It's, it's fun stuff. So quick first impressions on this one that I've just bought. So this is a 40% plank easy keyboard and it's ortho linear, which means it's just a grid of keys. There's no staggering between the rows. And um, there's a lot of reasons why I prefer that. And that's again for another video, but my first impressions of this one here so far, are just, you know, it's, it's awesome. It's perfect. It's not Bluetooth. It's just always connected to the cable. So the lights are always on, which is nice. They're super bright as well, but it's really, really light. I can just slip it into a case with the iPad and there's no weight to that at all. So it's a really nice portable package. So keep an eye on the channel for a full review of this keyboard, as well as more videos discussing the difference between ortho linear versus staggered keyboard layouts too. It's all quite an interesting topic. And uh, as it's your main productivity device when you're working with computers, I think it is worth taking seriously and looking into and uh, have some fun with it. So, okay, so I'm going to do a little test of the switches on this tester so you can hear what they sound like and maybe see a little bit too. Uh, so the microphone's just here, so you should hear them quite loudly. So uh, I'm not quite sure which color is which. This is, I'm not going to go into too much depth on this. There are extensive YouTube videos on that, just really to give you an idea of the difference between the ones that are available. So this top one's a green one, and that's got a really obvious click. So there's a sort of artificial click and it's also got a bump. So as you push it down, it's not smooth all the way down. You can feel it. You might even be able to see that. It's, uh, you know, sort of changes the resistance as it goes down. So yep, yeah, it's quite fun. So this one is just a bump, but no click. This one is click, different kind of click and a bump. Little, little bump, no click, no bump no click, not much pressure. So there's kind of three areas that change through this, the, the resistance, you know, how much pressure you need to push down, whether there's a bump, the subtlety of that bump, whether there's a click and the subtlety of the click. That's that one, which is kind of clicky with a little bump. That's a bump, but no click. That's no bump, medium kind of strength, but a bit firmer than the others. And then this one's a really firm one, but no bump and no click. So that's kind of really quite springy on that one. So yeah, these are great fun. You can just tap away on them and decide which one you want to live with. I didn't go with the clicky one in the end. I went with the one with a bump and no click. So stay productive and I'll see you in the next one.